Hey there, and welcome to another one of these weekly art videos. I hope you're having an amazing day wherever you are in the world, and thanks so much for joining me on this one. Today, I'm sharing a watercolor painting tutorial that is gonna be awesome for those of you getting started with this medium or looking to expand or improve on your shading techniques. I'm gonna be explaining exactly how to use analogous colors which are groups of colors that are next to each other in the color wheel in order to create different variations of your colors, darker versions of your colors and lighter versions of your colors for believable shading. When I am working on a new watercolor piece, I almost always use analogous colors to develop my different values or tones throughout the different areas of my painting in order to bring in a level of realism into the piece, but simultaneously to allowing you to develop those different values and tones that you need for realism, Using analogous colors is super helpful for those of us who are looking for bright, vibrant colors in our pieces because analogous colors don't mute each other down like, say, complementary colors do. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be working on three studies of isolated objects. I'm going to be taking you through everything, starting with how I create my preliminary pencil sketch how I choose the specific colors that I'm gonna be bringing in for each item to the specific painting techniques that I like bringing in in order to create a sense of three-dimensional form and light and shadow. And with all that said, let's go ahead and jump straight in. I'm often asked lots of different questions in relation to shading with watercolor and using analogous colors is one of my main and favorite ways of doing my shading with this medium as this helps my colors stay very vibrant and very clean. However, there are many different ways to develop your different values when working with watercolor. Many artists out there, for example, enjoy using complementary colors, meaning colors that are opposite to each other in the color wheel, to develop their different values and create their believable sense of shading in their work. Complementary colors mute each other out. And so even though you're able to develop a wide range of values by making use of complementary colors, you're going to mute them down or tone them down a little bit, which, you know, a lot of times that's what artists are intending to do because they're looking for color to look a little bit more realistic. And usually color is not very realistic when it's just straight out of the pan or tube. Whereas other artists really like making use of a very vibrant color. And in these cases, using analogous colors, so colors that are next to each other in the color wheel, could be super, super helpful for these kinds of styles. As I am painting these fruits and vegetables that I'm going to be sharing with you today, you're going to see me use analogous colors to create that sense of 3D-ness in the vegetable or fruit itself. And then, so that I can explain mixing complementary colors together, I'm going to be painting the cast shadow below these objects using a mixture of complementary colors. So there's a lot to learn about and practice in these studies. And I would highly recommend these to anyone just getting started with watercolor or even if you're a little bit more advanced and you've been consistent with your art practice for many months. These exercises can really help you advance and increase your knowledge of color mixing and the color wheel and just develop your technique for shading. It's essential to understand both analogous and complementary colors. These are color mixtures that you're going to be coming back to again and again and again. It doesn't matter what kind of subject it is that you like painting. It's super important to know about these different ways that you can mix colors together to develop your different values and the overall color effects that you're going for. Let's go ahead and jump straight into the pencil sketching process. So if you've watched any of my past sketching or drawing tutorials before, you already know that I always start from general largest shapes and I make my way towards smaller shapes and specifics and smaller details. You can see how I'm going in with lines. I'm just laying down lines and I'm focusing more on like creating a big blocky shape and overall major angles that I see in that eggplant shape. This is what I refer to as an envelope. I'm not really worrying about creating perfect curves or anything like that. And I'm just continuing to observe that shape that I see in that reference photo and modify and refine as I go. As I am doing all this, I'm drawing very lightly with my HB drawing pencil. 
And this is important so that I can A, erase mistakes along the way easily, B, so that I don't scratch or damage my watercolor paper, and C, I don't like seeing my pencil work through my paint at the end. And if I create very um, dark lines and I start pressing down too hard on my watercolor paper, that is definitely going to uh, show at the end and I run the risk of damaging my paper. So I make sure to do everything nice and light and I first focused on getting in that largest shape effectively and once I was happy with that overall shape, with the proportions and everything, and it looked believable, I then started moving into the medium-sized shapes, which I am drawing right now, which in this case would be the, the little stem and leaves at the top of the eggplant here. You can see me refine those leaf shapes until I like them. And finally, once I am happy with how everything is looking, I then go ahead and start adding in the smallest little lines and details. As long as you're continuing to draw lightly, you shouldn't have issues with not being able to erase mistakes or dirtying things up too much. Now, if you're still having trouble drawing lightly, this probably means that you don't have enough control over your drawing tools already developed, and I would recommend doing simple drills drawing basic lines and basic shapes on something like a large newsprint paper pad or a larger sketchbook and really get used to holding your pencil effectively for drawing from higher above and not super close to the tip. I'm going to be leaving links to a past video in which I shared some exercises that I often share with beginners getting started with drawing. You're going to be able to find that down below in the text section of this tutorial so that you can go and check it out and practice those drills. After finishing with my drawing of the eggplant, I took time to observe that reference photo and noticed where the lightest areas are, where the midtones are, and where the darkest areas throughout the eggplant itself were. And I created little mappings for myself. I drew very, very light shapes where I saw the lightest values and also the darkest values within that eggplant. And I also added in that shape for the cast shadow below the eggplant. It's always super important to notice the location of the light source in relation to the object or the subject and also all of these major uh, value areas, the highlights, the midtones, the darkest darks. If we're looking to add realistic shading and developing values in our drawings or paintings, that is essential to observe, to pinpoint, and to acknowledge before getting into the actual drawing or painting process. If there is only one single light source in the environment lighting that object, then it should be relatively easy um, unless the photo is over or underexposed, it should be easy to pinpoint where the location of the light source is. Usually the light source is going to be opposite to the cast shadow. So check out what I'm doing for this orange here, which the process for this orange was exactly the same as the eggplant. I am now mapping out the sections of highlights, midtones, and darkest darks, and I'm adding in the shape for the cast shadow. So in the case of the orange, we can see how the cast shadow is on the surface below the orange and to the right of the orange, right? So this means that the light source is above the orange and to the left. It's hitting the orange from the top left. In the case of the eggplant, you can see how the highlights are in the centermost part of that body and closer to the top edge of the eggplant than to the lower edge. This means that the light source is hitting the eggplant from directly in front of it, but slightly above it. And finally, there's a similar thing going on here with the lime. We get that sense that the light source is hitting the lime somewhere near the center of it, so it's in front of the lime and hitting the lime slightly from above because the highlights are pretty much centered in its, in its body, its shape, but closer to the upper edge than to the lower edge of that shape. Both the main highlight, lightest light shape, and the cast shadow shape 
in both the eggplant and the lime are pretty much centered but closer to the top edge than to the bottom edge. And this tells me that the light source is in front of these objects and above them, pretty much centered in front of them. There's something very different going on in terms of the light situation with the orange because in the orange you can very clearly see that the highlight shapes and the cast shadow shape are on opposite sides. So in that case the light source is hitting the object more from one side and it's not centered like with the other objects. One last thing that I would really like to point out and I would love for you to observe before moving forward is how there is a sense of reflected light um, in all of these objects. So in the case of the eggplant and the lime, I can really get that reflected light, especially along the lower edges of these objects where the light is hitting that surface that the objects are on and the surface is bouncing back some amount of light onto the lower planes of these objects. This is something we're often going to see in objects that have curves to them. In the case of the orange, that reflected light along the lower portion of the orange is harder to see, but I do see some lighter values opposite to the light source. And these lighter values are probably also created due to reflected light. The major highlight sections on the left of this orange where that light source is hitting the orange have warm undertones to them. They look more yellowish. To me, this indicates that there is some sort of artificial lamp hitting the object from this side. And then opposite to that, there are lighter values too. But those lighter values look cooler in temperature to me. They look whiter. So this tells me that these lighter values are created due to different things. There's probably some white fabric, white material, paper, whatever it is, white things are very reflective themselves, but there could also be some sort of uh, reflective photography screen opposite to the light source that is having that bouncing effect. Always remember that there are different variables in the environment that the object or the subject is in that is going to directly impact the values and the colors that we see throughout the object or the subject. Whatever the case may be, what I want you to notice is how there are lighter values on both sides of the orange, and there are darker values and darker midtones along the middle portion. My process for all of these sketches was exactly the same. I worked from general, I made my way towards specifics, and I made sure to draw lightly so that I could refine my drawing along the way. And once I was happy with my three sketches, I then used my kneaded eraser to lighten up my sketches a little bit more and get rid of any excess graphite that might be floating around on my watercolor paper so that I didn't run the risk of muddying up or dirtying up my vibrant color when it came time to paint these. And with my sketches ready, it was time to get started with creating my color mixtures. If you've been through any of my painting tutorials in the past, then you're probably already well aware of how important it is to plan and prepare the colors that you're gonna be using for your piece or for your studies before getting started with the painting process because it's super important to know how you're gonna be developing your different values, lights, midtones, and darks, and also if you're gonna be creating different hues, you have to know what you're gonna be doing before getting into it. And so that's what I'm doing right here. I am making sure that I know what colors exactly I'm gonna be using for each object and how I'm gonna be developing my shadows both inside of the object itself as well as for my cast shadows, which cast shadows are super important to situate the object in place and actually make it look like it's on a surface and it's not floating in the air. So as I said in the beginning of this video, I am going to be developing the different values in the objects by using analogous colors and I'm gonna be developing the cast shadow below the objects or on the surface using complementary colors. To paint my lime, I'm going to be using three analogous colors, which are yellow, yellow green, and green. To create those three analogous colors, I used my lemon yellow and my sap green. My yellow is simply plain lemon yellow with some water in it. The yellow green is a mixture of lemon yellow plus sap green plus water. 
And finally, of course, my green is just plain sap green with some water in it. So now comes creating the color for the cast shadow, which I'm going to be doing with complementary colors. And for the lime, because I would say that green is the major base color in the lime, I went with red for its complementary because red is opposite to green in the color wheel. So the red that I'm going to be using is permanent red light. I swatched it out right here and then what I did was I mixed together an almost 50-50 amount of sap green plus permanent red light for my cast shadow color. So you can see how by mixing together my red and my green I created a very dark almost brown looking color because again red and green because they're complementary colors in the color wheel they mute each other out they create this neutral desaturated color that is quite natural and of course just like with the analogous color mixtures we can always modify the ratios of the colors in our complementary mixtures to get it more towards the red or towards the green or whatever colors it is that we're using in that mixture this is just a 50-50 amount that I decided to go for for my cast shadow shapes. But you can always shift your color mixtures towards one side or the other side by just modifying the ratios of your colors that you're mixing in. All right, so let's move on to the eggplant colors. So for the eggplant, I'm going to be using my three analogous colors, which are blue, blue violet and violet. The two colors that I am using to create these three analogous colors are ultramarine blue and permanent blue violet. So the first one that I swatched out right there at the top in this eggplant section is just pure ultramarine blue with some water in it. The second color that I swatched out was almost a 50-50 mixture of ultramarine blue and permanent blue violet. And this last color that I'm going to be swatching out is just pure permanent blue violet. And for my cast shadow color that I'm going to be bringing in for this one, because I would say that purple is the primary base color for the eggplant, I want an almost orange looking color because orange is complementary to purple in the color wheel. It's opposite to purple. And so I am bringing in Indian yellow, which even though it's a yellow, you know, in name, it's yellow. It's a very warm yellow. You can see it right there. It looks almost orange. So I thought that this one would work perfectly for a complementary to purple. All right, so what I'm doing right here is I am doing my best to create an almost 50-50 amount uh, mixture of this Indian yellow and my permanent blue violet. And once again, you're going to notice that I arrive at a very dark, rich, deep, brownish looking color. Okay, moving on to the colors that I'm going to be using to paint in the orange. So the three analogous colors that I'm going to be using for the orange are orange, red orange, and red. I'm going to be using permanent red light and Indian yellow to create those three analogous colors. So right here at the top, I've just swatched out my Indian yellow with some water in it. Now I am creating a mixture of Indian yellow plus permanent red light for that red orange. And finally, I am going to be swatching out pure permanent red light for my red. Okay, so moving on to the color that I'm going to be using to paint in the cast shadow shape under the orange. And in this case, I would say that the base color that I'm going to be using for my orange is the color that I created in the middle by mixing together my permanent red light and my Indian yellow. So because I created that color by mixing those two together, I am first mixing those two and then I'm going to be adding in the complementary color to orange in the color wheel, which is blue. So after having created that red orange again, I am bringing back the ultramarine blue that I used for my eggplant. I am adding a good amount of this ultramarine blue until I arrive at a very nice, deep, rich, brownish color mixture. And that's what I'm going to be using for the cast shadow. So in this final column, you're going to see me create an extra little swatch there. And this is just because I had to create a mixture of my Indian yellow and my permanent red light before adding the ultramarine blue into it for that complementary color mixture. 
but don't overcomplicate things. I just did this because I had a yellow and I had a red. So if you picked out a ready-made orange for yourself, then it's simply that orange plus your ultramarine blue or whatever blue it is that you chose. And once again, you can see how I've arrived at a very dark, rich, deep, almost brown looking color there. All right, and with that, we're all ready to get started with today's studies. Even though I am using different sets of colors for all of these objects, the process really is exactly the same. I am going to be working from the lightest color of the group that I've prepared for the object on hand, and I'm going to make my way towards the darker color. I am going to observe my reference photo constantly throughout the painting process, really acknowledging different value areas and making those different values happen to the best of my abilities as I am painting. I am not really paying attention to texture right now. Don't worry about texture. Texture really comes secondary to value. This is an exercise in value and color development. And this is why I decided to leave the texture technique until the very end. Focus on value. Okay, so let's get started with the lime. I think the lime is probably the easiest, so that's why I wanted to start with that one. For the lime, I am going to be using my size 12 round brush. I think that's a pretty good size for this size of shape. Now, using these analogous colors that I have pre-selected for this object, I am going to be just uh, tweaking those color mixtures a little bit so that I can have them nice and ready for me uh, before actually starting to paint. Because this is a lime and not a lemon, I am going to be adding just a teeny tiny bit of my sap green into my lemon yellow to make it a yellow green color. So that's going to be my initial lightest color that I'm going to be starting out with. And then I'm going to prepare a second mixture that is going to be a medium green. So once again, I'm going to be mixing together my lemon yellow and my sap green, only this mixture is going to be heavier on the sap green than the lemon yellow, which is going to make it darker. And then finally, for my darkest values, I'm going to be preparing a third color for myself, and that is going to be plain sap green with a little bit of water in it. All of my color mixtures are pretty nice and juicy. They have a good amount of pigment in them, but they also have plenty of water in them so that they have a nice flow to them. They're not super dry or anything like that. Okay, so as I said, I am always going to be working from lightest color and making my way towards my darkest color. We're going to be painting on paper that is dry. I haven't done any pre-wetting with clean water at all. And when I paint on paper that is dry, I almost always like making sure that I'm going in with paint that is pretty translucent, meaning I go in with only a small amount of color and I make sure that my paint is pretty watered down. I make sure to test out my color on my scrap piece of watercolor paper to make sure that I'm not going in with paint that is too saturated or too dry or too thick so that I can build towards my darker values and my more saturated um, placement of color. You're gonna notice that I paint everything except that brightest highlight shape that I mapped out for myself. I wanna leave that dry and protect it throughout the painting process because the whiteness and brightness of the paper is gonna stand in place for my brightest white highlights. As I move along, that highlight is gonna become smaller though, so there's that but I wanna make sure that I am keeping that section protected because when we're painting with watercolor, it's the whiteness of the paper that stands in place for our highlights. And if we don't plan for those highlights and we cover them up with paint, we're gonna get rid of those brightest values that we really need if we want something to look realistic. If we want something to look realistic and 3D, we need a wide range of values from very light lights or brightest highlights to a wide range of midtones to our darkest darks. All right, so initially I went in with that lightest green. I painted in everything except for that brightest highlight shape. 
And along the way, as I was painting in the shape, I took a little bit of water from my container and smoothed some water over that entire shape with that initial green in there. This is gonna make that green look even lighter because you're diluting that color even more. And simultaneously, by going over the entire shape again with just a little bit of water in your paintbrush, you're going to make it so that that shape stays wetter for longer. And that is important because we're painting on dry paper and paper that is dry absorbs that color very quickly and everything dries very quickly and we want everything to stay wet so that we're able to place our medium green and then our darker green while everything is still wet so that we can have those smooth transitions and soft gradients between our different values. Right here you can see me go in with a damp paintbrush and I'm softening the edges between my lightest green and my brightest highlight section. You can always go in and soften edges while that paint is still wet. And right here, I'm starting to place this initial green in a more saturated state here and there after having worked on my lightest, most translucent layer and making sure that that lightest, most translucent layer was still pretty wet. So I would highly, highly recommend taking your time when you're painting in that initial layer of your lightest green, making sure that everything is still pretty wet before starting to apply a more saturated version of your lightest green, and then of course your medium green, and then your darkest green. Because as I said, when you're working on dry paper, your paper is gonna dry pretty fast, and if you wanna be left with soft transitions between your values and you don't want any choppiness, any lines between your values or patchiness of any kind, you need to make sure that everything is pretty wet and that you're working relatively quickly. Okay, so with that initial layer of lightest green there and still wet, still workable, I am now going in with my medium green. So this is my lemon yellow plus sap green color mixture that is heavier on the sap green. And I am observing that reference photo and noticing darker mid-tone areas. And that is where I'm placing in this medium green. I am staying away from lightest value areas where I just want that previous layer of lightest green shine through uncovered by this next darker green. Remember that the goal here is to create a wide range of values. So you're not trying to cover up the previous lightest values, the most translucent placement of color that you've created. You want to add to that. You want to build darker values upon that and leave the lightest values shining through and definitely keep those highlight sections protected. And of course, as you're creating these darker midtones and darkest dark value shapes, you need to make sure that they make sense with what you're seeing in that reference photo. This isn't to say that you have to be super precise about the shape of those different uh, value areas or even their placement, because that can be slightly off but it does have to make sense with what you're seeing in that reference photo. It has to make sense with what we were talking before about the light situation, with where the light source is hitting that three-dimensional object from. It, it has to make sense with the three-dimensional structure of the object itself. If you forget about these things or start placing your color just without these things in mind, it's very likely that at the end, you're not going to arrive at that three-dimensional look that you're going for. So really train yourself to observe that reference photo and to bring to mind all of the super important knowledge of the fundamentals such as light behavior and also three-dimensional form. If you wanna get really good at shading something, it's imperative that you understand how value, meaning the lightness to darkness of our different colors, and three-dimensional form and light behavior are all interrelated. You see, light hits a three-dimensional structure's planes or sides, and this creates the values that we see throughout that three-dimensional structure. And it's the values that we see in that reference photo or whatever it is that we're drawing or painting that we have in front of us in real life 
that creates a sense of 3Dness and depth and volume in our artwork. Okay, so this is me still working with the medium green. I made sure to place just a small amount of paint at a time in the spots where it made sense, and everything is still workable at this state because I made sure to take my time with that initial lightest layer of paint. Everything is still pretty workable because I took my time with that first layer. After having placed some amount of the medium green in darker mid-tone areas, what I am doing right here is I am doing some lifting. I am using the bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge to pick up some excess pigment from areas that I feel I may be flattened out way too much or that simply aren't that dark in the photo. Remember that while your paint is still wet, you can do a bunch of different things. As long as your paint is still workable, you can drop in more paint if you want to darken certain areas. You can do some lifting with your absorbent towel or uh, the bristles of your paintbrush, use them as a little absorbent sponge. Or you can even soften transitions between different values or your highlight edges using the clean and slightly damp bristles of your paintbrush. And the more you practice with watercolor, you're going to find that the more confidently you go in and start dropping in your color, and overall, the less moving around you do of paint after it's been placed on paper. And that, my friend, in and of itself, is going to lead to better results. All of this comes with practice, with developing water control and brush control, and it'll come to you in time, believe me. Okay, so I finally started dropping in my darkest green. This is plain sap green with a bit of water in it, and I am making sure this time to only place this darkest green in sections that are really darkest value areas in that reference photo. Because I am using my darkest color, I am making sure to only place a small amount in areas that I'm really looking to push those darker values in, and I am staying away from lightest midtones and lightest light areas. Right here, I remove that green from my paintbrush bristles, and I am going back in with just a teeny tiny bit of water in my paintbrush bristles to soften out once again the transition um, line between my highlight shape and the values around that highlight shape just to get it a little bit softer. Here I am doing a little bit more lifting with the clean and slightly damp bristles of my paintbrush, using that paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge while everything is still wet. Just adding a little bit more dimension into areas that I feel I flattened out a little bit too much especially sections of reflected light in the lower planes of that line. And everything was still pretty wet at that point, still workable, and the more you practice, the better you're going to become at knowing when your paper is starting to dry and when you should definitely just stop working and allow that to dry completely because if you keep working, you're just going to be creating backgrounds and splotchiness and undesired effects. Okay, so I was pretty happy with the wide range of values that I created all throughout the line. They made sense with what I was seeing in that reference photo. As you can see, I have that brightest highlight shape, which is now way smaller than what it was initially. But by planning out that larger shape, I gave myself a little bit more leeway and more control in order to make sure that at the end, I would be left with at least some amount of bright white paper shining through. I also have some very light, very translucent green sections. I have a wide range of lighter midtones, and I have some darker green sections. And it was now time to allow everything to dry so that I could start painting in the section of cast shadow under this object. It's important to allow that line to dry completely before painting in the cast shadow, which is a shape right next to below that object, if you don't want your colors to start merging together. So my two complementary colors that I mix together for this cast shadow under the lime are my sap green and my permanent red light. So as you just saw, the color that I swatched out was a dark, deep, rich, almost brown looking color. And that is what I'm going to go in with. I'm still using the same size 12 round brush, by the way. You can feel free to use a smaller brush if you feel more comfortable, but I am painting in the entire kind of oval shape cast shadow under the lime with a 
I would say semi-translucent version of this complementary color mixture. It's not super dark and saturated. And this is because even within this cast shadow shape, I want to make sure that I have sections that are lighter in value and more translucent and other sections nearer the lime itself, which are darker and more saturated. That is gonna create a more believable look for your cast shadow, making sure that you have a range of values even within the cast shadow. So while that initial layer of brown color was still wet, I then dropped in even more of this complementary color mixture in the sections nearest the lime. And this is because quite often we have that section of occlusion shadow within the larger cast shadow shape. The occlusion shadow is the section darkest in the cast shadow right beside the object where the object is impeding that light from hitting the surface beneath it. And that section is darkest because it's not receiving any reflected light either. Whereas other sections of cast shadow as the cast shadow extends away from the object, they do start receiving a little bit more light. And if you observe those three reference photos, they all show that occlusion shadow, that darkest area within the larger cast shadow shape. With those browns in and still wet, I then started dropping in a little bit of my sap green into some sections here and there to create little blooms and just a little bit more interest with color in the cast shadow area. By placing some green in that cast shadow under the lime, I also integrate the shadow with the subject a little bit more, harmonize things a little bit better. After having finished all that, I wanted to soften out the edge of the cast shadow a little bit. So what I did while that paint was still wet was I removed the color from my paintbrush bristles and I went back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush and ran the bristles of my paintbrush along those edges. That created a little bit of a bleeding effect, which left me with a blurrier, undefined uh, edge around that shape because obviously we painted that shape in on dry paper. And when we paint on dry paper, we're gonna be left with sharp defined edges around our shapes. Okay, so as you can see, the colors inside of the lime are very bright, very vibrant because we used analogous colors to create those different values within the object itself. And the color work developed outside of the object or underneath the object in this case for that cast shadow, they are more muted out because we used complementary colors. They are desaturated, they are kind of neutralized. All right, you guys, and with that, we're all done with the lime for now. It was time to allow that to dry. And we're now going to get to work on the second object, which is going to be the eggplant. I made sure to change my water because this is an exercise with color and we wanna make sure that we're not polluting our different color mixtures or making things look muddy because we have so much more of another color in that container or even in our paintbrush bristles. So I would recommend doing that before getting to work on this second object. Now for this one, because the shape is bigger, I'm going to be using my size 16 round brush. And just like with the lime, I'm getting started with my first lightest color of the group that I have prepared for the eggplant, which in this case is the ultramarine blue. And I'm making sure to go in with this color in a pretty watered down state. And then I'm only placing a small amount of pigment in this initial layer. I make sure to keep that large highlight shape that I have planned for myself protected and unpainted. However, just like with the first one, you're gonna notice that that large highlight shape becomes smaller and smaller as I go. Help yourself with your scrap piece of watercolor paper to make sure that you're going in with your initial color in a pretty translucent watered down state. And I continue paying attention to how much pigment or color I am placing on my paper. When I feel that I have a good amount of color, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and I go back in with just a small amount of water in my paintbrush and do that smoothing out all over this initial layer, all over that shape, excluding the highlight, of course. And this is so that A, I can make that initial layer even lighter and more translucent so that that can become my lightest blue values that I'm going to have in this object and also be so that I can make sure that this entire 
layer stays wet so that I can then start dropping in a slightly more saturated version of the same color and then move on to my second darker color and then my third darker color while everything is still nice and wet and workable so that I can have those nice soft transitions between my different values. So again, just like with the first one, I want to encourage you to really take your time with that initial layer. Yes, of course, you want to be nice and gentle always when you're working with watercolor or working on paper, which can get very easily overworked, but make sure that you take your time with your initial layer and go over everything at least, I would say, three to four times so that you can ensure that everything is still nice and wet and you can do all of this hue and value development while everything is still in a workable state. Okay, so I did my painting of that initial most translucent layer. I then went ahead and placed that same initial blue, the ultramarine blue in a slightly more saturated state in sections that I wanted to darken even more. And I am now getting to work on my medium color that I chose for this object, which is the blue purple. So this is ultramarine blue plus permanent blue violet. So I'm going in and placing this color mindfully, looking at that reference photo and making sure that I am placing it in darker mid-tone areas where it makes sense. I want to make sure that at the end I have at least some sections where that blue is shining through and it's not being covered by the purple. So I have a good amount of color placed on my paper here and before thinking of placing any more, I'm going to do a little bit of work. In some cases, I am helping those two colors, the blue and the blue purple, merge a little bit more softly into each other. So I'm helping those gradients out a little bit by actually going in very gently with my paintbrush. In other cases, I am doing some lifting using the cleanest slightly damp bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge. And I'm also going to be softening the edges of my large white highlight shape. All of those things I do by going in with a clean and only slightly damp paintbrush. And I do these movings around of the color that I've placed on my paper very, very gently and as minimally as possible. My paper is still in a very workable state because I took time with that first layer and I am doing a little bit of this work with the paint that is already on my paper before thinking of adding any more. Like I said before, it's super important to continue paying attention to how much paint you're placing on paper and coming back and taking a step back and noticing if you actually need any more and take a little bit of a break to check on your different values so far before thinking of adding more paint. After doing a bit of work, I go in and add a little bit more of my medium color, which in this case is my blue purple. Right around here, you're gonna see me do a little bit more lifting with my clean and slightly damp paintbrush, using my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge. You're gonna see me pick up excess paint in sections that I feel are not very dark or that I've perhaps flattened out a little bit too much. I wanna make sure that I am absorbing that excess paint, especially in areas of reflected light in the lower planes of the eggplant. And then finally, I am ready to start doing my darkest values with my darkest color, which in this case is the permanent blue violet. And you're gonna notice that this darkest color, once again, I make sure to only exclusively place in the darkest value sections that I'm able to see in that reference photo. And I leave all of the previous lighter colors and lighter values shine through in lighter midtones and lightest light sections. As I continue working on my values and keeping those lightest areas protected and thinking of where the midtones are and really looking to only push darkest dark sections with this darkest color, I'm really sculpting this three-dimensional object and making this little illustration come to life. I want to encourage you to go in with a good amount of color and don't be afraid of placing a good amount of paint on your paper as long as you keep those highlights protected and you're continuing to observe your reference photo, paying attention to value areas and thinking of the three-dimensional structure of the object as well as the location of the light source in regards to the object, you're going to be okay, especially if you're working relatively quickly and while that paper is still wet. 
and you can lighten sections back up and add more dimension into sections that you have perhaps accidentally flattened out a little bit too much with too much color. These are little techniques that I use time and time again throughout all of these. Just a moment ago, I did some absorbing of excess paint in those light value reflected light sections in the underneath planes of this eggplant. As long as the paint is still wet and workable, you can always go in and do lifting, do softening, help those gradients out a little bit if you need to, so create softer transitions between different value areas that maybe aren't organically happening as well as you'd want them to, and darken areas if you need to with more color. This said, you wanna make sure that your lightest light areas of highlight, your brightest highlight, is always protected because you can never really go back to the whiteness the paper once had once you have painted on top of it. You can certainly remove some color in the majority of cases, but you can never actually go back to the brightness and the whiteness the paper once had in the beginning. Okay, so once I was happy with the development of blue and purple values in the eggplant's body, it was time to do my work with the greens in the little stem and leaves at the top. For this smaller shape, I switched on over to my size 4 round brush. So for my work with the greens here, I'm going to use my same colors that I use for the lime. And the process is exactly the same. I am going in initially with my lightest color of the bunch that I used for the lime, which in this case was my lemon yellow plus a little bit of sap green. Again, I went in initially with this color in a pretty translucent, watered-down state. I made sure to run the bristles of my paintbrush throughout this entire shape to make sure that it was still nice and wet before I dropped in my second color and then my darkest green color. Even in this stem and leaf portion of the eggplant, I left little teeny tiny sections of highlights, and those just happened organically as I was moving my paintbrush around but I really like incorporating at least some amount of bright highlights in all of the different parts of my object so that I can bring a little bit more of that wide range of values that I've been talking about everywhere throughout my illustration or my painting if I am working on a full painting. I'm really simplifying the stem and the leaf portion especially, and I'm not really bringing in a lot of texture into this area and all those little lines that I see in the reference photo. Again, I am focusing primarily on developing a sense of three-dimensional form via values because that is the objective for these studies. Once I finished up with my initial lightest green layer, I dropped in some medium green, which is also a mixture of my lemon yellow and my sap green, but that medium green was heavier on the sap green. And then finally, I started dropping in the darkest green only in certain sections here and there, which was just pure sap green with a bit of water in it. So you can see how along with those teeny tiny highlight shapes that I left unpainted, I was able to develop a range of values throughout the leaves and the stem. Once my green values were developed, I then decided to go in with a little bit of my purple and drop in this purple here and there. In that reference photo, I do get a sense for a bit of purple in the leaves and the stems, and I thought it would be a great way to add a little pop of color in the green and also integrate the stem and leaves with the actual eggplant and make everything look a little bit more unified and harmonious. It's super important though that after you've placed your purple on top of those green sections, wherever you're gonna be adding in that purple, that you don't go in and start moving that purple around and doing a ton of merging of your green with your purple because you're gonna get rid of that purple effect and you can even start creating muddiness, especially because purple is a secondary color that gets created by mixing together blue and red. And as we were talking about before, red is complementary to green in the color wheel. So by mixing together purple and green, you can accidentally start muting out your green in the stem. And this is because purple has a little bit of red in it, which is complementary to green, which is going to mute it out. So drop in your purple confidently and then allow the paint to do its own thing and do minimal and very gentle moving around if you're gonna be moving it once it's been placed on paper. Keep it to a minimum and don't start mindlessly just merging the purple into the green. 
Once I'm pretty happy with the development of values and hues throughout the stem and the leaves, you're going to see me go in with my clean and slightly damp paintbrush and do a little bit of lifting to add some dimension back up into lighter value sections that perhaps I feel are a little bit too flat. So this is me going in and using my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge and picking up some excess paint while it's still wet, adding dimension back into the section of the eggplant. All right, it was time to allow that to dry and we're now going to get to work on the cast shadow section right below this object. So we're going to be using our complementary colors for this one. And for the eggplant, we're going to be using Indian yellow, which is a very warm, almost orangey looking yellow. And we're going to mix it into the permanent blue violet, which is the main base color, I would say, for this illustration. So orange and purple are complementary colors, which create this very deep, rich, dark, almost brown looking color. I'm going to swatch it right here for you on this scrap piece of watercolor paper. And the process is going to be exactly the same as with the lime. To paint in this cast shadow section below the eggplant, I'm actually using my size 16 round brush. Because I didn't take time to water down my color a little bit and swatch out my color on my scrap piece of watercolor paper to test out translucency, and just make sure that I was going in with a very translucent color, I go in pretty saturated right off the bat. I would recommend that you go in with color that is a little bit, at least a little bit more watered down and more translucent so that you can, again, build your dark values within that cast shadow shape, especially closest to the object. Because I go in initially with very saturated color, my entire cast shadow shape ends up being a little bit too large. And later on, when I'm softening the edge, I actually go in and make it smaller by picking up some, some of that excess paint with my absorbent towel. You're gonna see how I fix that later. But yeah, the process is exactly the same. Go in with this color, paint in that pretty translucent initial layer drop in a little bit more of this color in a slightly more saturated state nearest the object for that occlusion shadow effect. And then once you're happy with your development of values in the cast shadow area, then you can remove the color from your paintbrush bristles and go back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush and soften the edges of that cast shadow shape. You can see me right here running the bristles of my paintbrush along these edges which creates a little bit of a bleeding effect and because I have so much of that very saturated color that cast shadow becomes a little bit too large for me and I make it smaller in just a bit by going in especially in the right portion of the cast shadow I use my absorbent towel to make that cast shadow shape smaller by absorbing some of that color back up. Right here, you can see me work on softening that color and developing more sections of translucent values because I went in with this color in a very saturated, heavy state initially. I cannot recommend having scrap pieces of watercolor paper on hand enough. When I am painting, especially a complete larger piece, I always, always have them on hand to test out my colors and my level of translucency so that I can really make sure that what I have in my paintbrush is actually what I want before going into my painting. So even though I did have those scrap pieces of watercolor paper on hand and I did test out the color itself, I didn't water down that color mixture and test it out once again before starting to paint in order to ensure that the level of translucency was where I wanted it to be. When we're painting with watercolor, both our color or the hue itself, as well as the translucency of that color have to make sense based on what we're doing at that given point in time in the painting process. We're constantly watering down paint if we need that color to be lighter and more translucent or thickening that paint by adding more paint to, to the mixture if we need that color to be darker or more saturated. All right, so with the eggplant finished, it was time to move on to the third object that we're gonna be painting today, which is the orange. For the orange, I'm gonna be using my size 16 round brush. My first lightest color is going to be just my Indian yellow. And then the second or the medium color is going to be Indian yellow plus permanent red. 
light. That second mixture is going to be heavier on the Indian yellow than the permanent red light. And then my darkest color mixture is going to be once again a mixture of Indian yellow plus permanent red light, but that one is going to be heavier on the permanent red light. For the orange, I don't want to use the red by itself because I don't want my orange to start turning red. So the process for the orange is exactly the same as what we've been doing for the lime and the eggplant. The order of steps is exactly the same, only this time of course we're using a different combo of colors. So my lightest color for the orange is my Indian yellow. I create that initial very translucent layer for my orange all throughout this shape, excluding the major highlight sections. Once I've placed a good amount of color on my paper, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and go back in to run the bristles of my paintbrush over this entire shape with just a little bit of water in my paintbrush bristles, which is gonna water down that initial light color even more and lighten it even more, and simultaneously make it so that everything stays nice and wet by the time that I start dropping in the other colors, my medium color and then my darker color. After having dropped in a little bit more of that initial lightest color in a slightly more saturated state in sections of midtones, I'm preparing a little bit more of this medium color mixture that I'm using for the orange, which is my Indian yellow plus the permanent red light heavier on the Indian yellow. And I start dropping it into mid-tone and darkest dark sections that I'm able to see in that reference photo, allowing the previous lighter orange to shine through uncovered in lighter value sections. So as we observed in the reference photo in the beginning of this video, we noticed that the majority of darker mid-tone values and darkest darks are within the central part of that orange. And we notice a lot of lighter values on both the left and the right sides. Um, and of course, the major highlights are very near the left and right edges. So I am focusing on dropping in the majority of this medium color in the middle portion and also some little bits um, at the top of the orange for example where we have that concave area where the stem used to be and making sure that I'm placing both the medium mixture and also the darkest mixture which is what I'm getting started with right now which is once again that mixture of Indian yellow plus permanent red light but this time it's heavier on the permanent red light focusing on placing the medium and the darkest color mixtures in these darker value sections and leaving all of the previous lighter sections with only that first layer of lightest orange shining through completely uncovered. So once I place a good amount of paint on my orange and once I started to develop different value sections throughout the orange, I am then doing the exact same thing that I've been doing for the past two objects. I remove that color from my paintbrush bristles and I'm going back in with a clean and only slightly down paintbrush, working on helping the transitions between some of my values, just helping those colors merge a little bit better here and there, adding back dimension into certain sections by doing some lifting where perhaps I've flattened that area a little bit too much picking up excess paint that I have placed in reflected light sections, and also softening edges in those highlight shapes, which is going to make them look a little bit smaller. After that, I took a step back, I acknowledged the work in terms of values that I've created throughout the orange, and if I felt I needed to place a little bit more of that color to intensify certain areas or darken certain areas, I went ahead and did that mindfully and carefully, only placing more paint in necessary areas. Once again, because I took time with that initial lightest layer and because I am working relatively quickly, my paper is still in a workable state. I still have time to continue developing my values, to do lifting, to do softening, to move my paint around a little bit if I have to, etc. All this said, I try to keep the moving around of my paint after it's been placed on paper to a minimum because I know that it's very easy to start flattening everything out and arrive at an overworked look if I just mindlessly start moving that paint. Hopefully you've been able to see how much I've helped myself and supported myself with my absorbent towel along this entire process. Look at how often I'm dabbing the tip of my paintbrush on that absorbent towel 
as I remove either excess water or excess paint from my bristles and continue doing my lifting. This is why having some sort of absorbent towel or even just a few regular kitchen paper towels on hand when you're painting with watercolor is so imperative. It helps you stay on top of water control and also helps you fix little mistakes that you do along the way. All right, so for this orange, as you can see, I left one of the edges of the highlight and I just softened one section. Once I was happy overall with my development of different orange values, Used throughout this object. I dropped in a little bit of one of the greens that I had in my color mixing palette, which was the sap green plus the lemon yellow. In that top little part of the orange, that concave bit where the stem used to be. It was then time to allow that orange to dry completely, and after it was dry, I went ahead and started painting the cast shadow. So as we talked about in the beginning, for this one, I first created my orange by mixing together my Indian yellow plus my permanent red light and once I had that medium orange color I then added some ultramarine blue into that mixture. Blue is complementary to orange in the color wheel so that's why I went with blue and as you can see once again I arrived at a very dark rich deep brown looking color. Exploring different complementary color combinations to create browns and neutrals is super, super important, I feel, and very insightful as well because you can really get an understanding for how you can create browns that are cooler in temperature or warmer in temperature or even darker or lighter by combining different colors together and by creating your own brown color mixtures as opposed to using ready-made browns you can really shift the ratios of your colors in your brown color mixture to get them more towards the blue side or towards the orange side or towards the red side or towards the green side or whatever two colors it is that you combine together you can always play around with those ratios and see what happens all right so I painted painted in the cast shadow and the occlusion shadow for the orange exactly the same way that I painted in the cast shadow and occlusion shadows for the previous objects. I first went in with my initial layer of this brownish color and while that initial layer was still wet, I dropped in a little bit more of this color in the sections nearest the object to deepen and darken that occlusion shadow section. I then removed the color from my paintbrush bristles and went back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush and ran my bristles along the edges to soften some edges here and there. Once I was happy with my development of different brown values in that cast shadow shape, I removed that brown from my paintbrush bristles and I dropped in a little bit of orange while that brown was still wet. This helped me add a little bit more color and interest into that cast shadow and also helped me integrate and unify that object with its shadow. Once I was done with the shadow, it was time to get started with adding in some detail in all of these objects and I get started with the orange. It was finally time to switch to the smallest detailing brush that I am using for this process, which is my size one round brush. So for all of these little details that I'm going to be developing in all these objects, essentially I am starting with the same color that I was using for that layer underneath. So for example, in this case, I am darkening certain little abstract shapes in this top section of the orange where the stem used to be. So I started with that medium green that I had in this area because I had already dropped that medium green into the orange. It was underneath. I used that same green, started darkening certain little shadow sections in this area that I'm able to perceive in that reference photo, and then I took it a step darker and started using my darkest green to darken certain little abstract shapes within that. As I am adding these details, essentially I'm just pushing little dark areas that I am seeing in that reference photo. I am not really trying to draw details out perfectly. I am mostly noticing shadow shapes and I am painting shadow shapes that I see, okay? It's super important that you see these shapes as little abstract irregular shapes that you are darkening, not as lines, not as marks, and try to stay away from drawing things out super perfectly. I am adding the minimal amount of detail possible to add a little bit more description into that section of, of the object. 
And again, you really want to pay attention to the color that you've already developed underneath, wherever it is that you're going to be developing that detail. Because, for example, if you have a very light value of whatever color it is underneath in that first layer of paint that you created, right? and you go on top of that with a very dark saturated color, that is gonna be very stark and distracting. It's gonna create a lot of contrast and the viewer's attention is gonna go straight to that area. We wanna keep these details subtle, minimal, and relatively loose. It's amazing how we're able to describe a lot with very little. If you focus on the right things, you can describe a lot with just a minimal amount of work and I really feel that when working, especially when working with watercolor, we want to keep things loose and we don't want to overly describe things because that's when things start looking very overworked and overly described and we want things to stay loose and fresh and light. Look for areas where little shadow shapes are created in that reference photo and darken those areas with very irregular abstract shapes, all while staying away from lines and obvious stark looking marks. So as you can see, I am continuing to jump around my different objects here. Um, for this orange, for example, I felt I needed to allow these initial little darker abstract shapes to dry before going in and um, adding a little bit more detail. So I am going in and just adding a little bit more green in this stem section. I'm going to develop a few more green values and then I'm also going to develop a little bit of darker orange values in those creases in the top of the orange coming out of that stem section. But even with those orange creases that I'm going to be developing, I am seeing those as abstract elongated shapes and not lines. If I go in and start drawing orange lines, that's not going to look very natural. So I'm first focusing on finishing with the green values that I'm going to be developing, those little green abstract shapes. And then I'm going to remove that green from my paintbrush bristles and I'm going to do my work with the orange. So again, I'm going in with the medium orange, which is a color that I had already used in this area. And I am making sure that it is not super stark looking as I start placing it on that first layer of paint. So throughout the next minute or so, you're going to see me continue to develop these orange values, these little abstract shapes in this area, making sure that things look pretty soft and subtle. Whenever I feel I've placed enough paint or I feel things look a little bit too much like lines or stark looking uh, solid shapes, I go in with just water in my paintbrush and soften things out. And I continue paying attention to how the paint is moving on my paper, how the paper is drying, especially because I'm painting on dry paper, things can dry pretty fast and you can be left with splotchiness. And the more you paint with watercolor, the better you're going to become at just knowing when you have to allow something to dry before coming back in and deepening and darkening or adding more detail or attempting to fix certain things. Okay, so I'm finally happy with how things are looking in this top part of the orange. I am happy with the detail that I've developed overall and I'm going to leave it at that. I think the main objective of these studies has been achieved. I have developed a nice sense of three-dimensional form in all of these objects via analogous colors and also did a quick exploration of complementary colors for those cast shadow areas. I allowed everything to dry completely and now I'm going to be sharing that trick that I was referring to at the beginning of this video before I do my splattering. So this is tracing paper from Strathmore and what I am doing using my HB pencil right here is I am very roughly, uh, not with pressure or anything, but I am very roughly just tracing over the shape of my eggplant, my lime, and also my orange. And then I'm going to cut these shapes out carefully using a pair of scissors. This is going to help me do my splattering and keep certain sections of my paper protected while I do my splattering in other sections, right? So I am going to do splattering in two separate sections. First, I'm going to do splattering using actual color or watercolor. And then I'm going to do my splattering using white gouache. 
when I'm doing my splattering with color, I don't want my orange splattering to get into my eggplant or my lime. And I don't want my green splattering to get into my orange and my eggplant. And I don't want my purple splattering to get into my lime and my orange, right? That makes sense. So I need to keep the other objects protected while I do my splattering in, in each of the objects. For the white splattering, it's not that big of a deal because I'm going to be using the, the white gouache in all of these to create a little bit of a, a texture in all of these. But when it comes to the actual watercolor, the color splattering, well, I want to keep the others protected. So here I am carefully cutting out these shapes using a pair of scissors. Essentially, I made a little cut or a little hole in the center and then I carefully insert my scissors into that little hole and then I'm carefully just making my way around the shape. All right, so I'm all done here. You can see how I was left with holes or shapes in this tracing paper that are exactly the size and shape of my three illustrations or at least the sections that I want to keep protected as I am doing my splattering. All right, so it is time to get started with the color splattering for each one of these. And I'm gonna get started with the lime. I'm just gonna take it um, in the same order that I worked on these in. And I'm gonna be using my size 12 round brush to do my splattering. Now, if you've never done splattering before, it is important that the consistency of your color mixture on your color mixing palette is going to be helpful for you for this technique. If it is way too thick or way too dry, then you're probably not going to be able to do any splattering. And if your mixture is super, super watery, then probably you're not even going to be able to see the color as you're doing your splattering. Plus, remember, watercolor always dries lighter than how it looks when it's wet. So you want to be able to see that splattering at the end, you know, subtly, but you want to be able to see it, right? If you've never done splattering before, there is nothing better that you can do than actually practicing your splattering on a separate sheet of paper. It doesn't even have to be watercolor paper but practice before actually adding it into your illustration. Just to make sure that the consistency of your color mixture is good, that is gonna be helpful, and also, of course, that the paintbrush that you've selected is gonna be helpful as well. Usually, for the splattering to happen effectively, you have to be using a paintbrush that has um, a snappy paintbrush bristles. So what I mean is that if you flick those bristles, they snap back right? It's not one of those floppy brushes that, you know, the, the bristles just go off to the side and they don't have a snap to them. So the consistency of your color mixture has to be good and also you have to choose a good paintbrush that is going to be good for your splattering. And you can see how I'm using my index finger and I am flicking those bristles of my paintbrush on the um, illustration that I'm doing the splattering on where I want to add that texture. I'm pretty close to my paper, I would say around two inches away from my paper, um, especially because I'm trying to keep that splattering in that one illustration, that one object, and I'm trying to keep it away from the others. I am using the medium color that I use for all of these, or the base color, so to speak, to do my splattering. This way it can be visible, but still relatively subtle. And finally, it's super, super easy to go overboard with the splattering. So I like doing just a bit at a time, taking little breaks and coming back to see if I've added enough. I'm gonna do my splattering in this last one in the orange, and then I'm gonna take a quick second and do a little bit more darkening of um, dark orange shapes at the top of the orange before allowing everything to dry and moving to the final part of this process, which is going to be the splattering with the white gouache. Here I am. I switched on back to my size one round brush, my detailing brush that I chose for this process. And I'm going in with my orange to do a little bit more darkening of abstract orange, darker mid-tone shapes at the top of the orange here before allowing everything to dry and doing my splattering with the white gouache. I wasn't able to get this section to how I wanted it to look before. Um, when I was working in this section, I got to a point at which I just needed to allow everything to dry before uh, coming back and fixing it. So that's what I did and it's why I'm doing it now. When working with watercolor, it's important to stay super patient and realize that sometimes 
we just have to take note of those sections where we have to come back and, and fix something and allow that to dry and allow that paper to regain its strength and come back later. Otherwise, we run the risk of making things worse or overworking our paper and damaging it. All right, you guys, so it is finally time for the very last uh, detailing with the splattering using the white gouache. So just a moment ago, I squeezed out a little bit of gouache onto this gouache mixing palette that I have. Gouache is way thicker straight out of the tube, so you're going to have to add a little bit of water into it, do some mixing, and get it to the right consistency so that you can do your splattering. So just play around with the gouache to water ratio and uh, just like what I suggested before, do some splattering on a scrap piece of paper to make sure it's coming out nice and fine and that the consistency of your gouache is gonna be helpful and also that the paintbrush that you're using for your splattering is gonna be helpful. So I'm using my cheaper multi-purpose size 10 round brush for my splattering and it also has a nice snap to those bristles. Again, I made sure not to go overboard by adding just a little bit of splattering at a time and taking breaks to come back to see the entire thing and asking myself if more was really necessary. Okay, so I was done with the splattering. I was left, as you can see, with a nice visual texture in all of these fruits and vegetables. And this is just an easy way to add that texture into this kind of object while keeping everything very organic, very irregular, and very natural. Okay, and just to finish up, I'm adding some final highlights and little sections for all of these objects using my white gouache, but I'm keeping that again to a minimum. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, make sure to check out everything that I am offering over at my Patreon membership website, because for a very small amount a month, you're gonna get immediate access to my exclusive tutorials, classes, and resources that I don't share anywhere else. All of these exclusive tutorials include my downloadable outline sketches so that you don't have to start from scratch, reference photos, and my supply lists. There's already a library of over 75 sketching and watercolor painting tutorials that are real time, meaning they are not sped up or edited. They are fully narrated and I take you through my entire process, making sure to explain everything as clearly as possible step by step. Two new exclusive full length tutorials are added into this exclusive library every single month. For those of you who are interested in really taking your artwork to the next level and want to know all of the inside secrets that I learned about in art school and courses that I've invested in myself, there's also a full library on classes on art fundamentals in which all of the bases are covered. That library has now over 35 classes and workshops all have assignments at the end that help you actually put your knowledge to the test. And there's a brand new class or workshop added at the beginning of every single month. As if all of this weren't enough, you also get a weekly sketchbook prompt sent to your inbox to help you stay consistent with your art practice. There's a live training, workshop, or paint along session with me every single month. Members in the $15 tier and upwards get access to thorough feedback from me on their work whenever they need it, and much, much more. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things, which you can choose from depending on your goals and needs needs. So go ahead and check it out. I'm going to make sure to leave a link where you can find out more down below in the description box of this video. And I would love, love, love to get to know more about you and your work and have you join this innermost art community of mine. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.